Thank, thank you, Sam, for that uh, warm introduction. Thank you all for coming, and um, thank you also again to the church for hosting us. Um, in um, 1977, a year before he killed himself, the Austrian writer Jean Amery came across press reports of systematic torture against Arab prisoners in Israeli prisons. Arrested in Belgium in 1943 while distributing anti-Nazi pamphlets, Amery himself had been brutally tortured by the Gestapo and then deported to Auschwitz. He managed to survive but could never look at his torments as things of the past. He insisted that those who are tortured remain tortured and that their trauma is irrevocable. Like many survivors of Nazi death camps, Jean Amery came to feel an existential connection, as he called it, to Israel in the 1960s. He obsessively attacked left-wing critics of Israel as thoughtless and unscrupulous. Amri, in fact, may have been one of the first to make the claim, which you hear very often these days, that virulent anti-Semites disguise themselves as virtuous anti-imperialists and anti-Zionists. Yet even the admittedly sketchy reports that he saw of torture in Israeli prisons prompted Amari to consider the limits of his solidarity with the Jewish state. In one of the last essays he published before he committed suicide, he wrote, I urgently call on Jews who want to be human beings to join me in the radical condemnation of systematic torture. Where barbarism begins, even existential commitments must end. Amory was particularly disturbed by the apotheosis in 1977 of Menahem Begin as Israel's Prime Minister. Begin, who had organized the 1946 bombing in the King David Hotel in Jerusalem that killed 91 people, was uh, the, one of the first frank exponents of Jewish supremacism, one of the first leaders um, of that kind. He was also the first to routinely invoke Hitler and the Shoah and the Bible while assaulting Arabs and building settlements in the occupied territories. The state of Israel in its early years had uh, an ambivalent relationship with the Shoah and its victims that lasted until the early 1960s. Israel's first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, initially saw Shoah survivors as human debris, his words, claiming that they had survived only because they had been bad, harsh, egotistic. It was Ben-Gurion's rival, Begin, a demagogue from Poland, who turned the murder of six million Jews into an intense national preoccupation and a new basis for Israel's national identity. Begin, who invented uh, tales of his own trauma in Hitler's Europe, uh, under him, the Israeli establishment took to collectively producing and disseminating um, a very particular memory of the Shoah that could legitimize a militant and expansionist Zionism. Jean-Amery noted the new rhetoric. He was categorical about its destructive consequences for Jews living outside Israel. He wrote that begin with the Torah in his arm and taking recourse to biblical promises, speaking openly of stealing Palestinian land, alone would be reason enough for the Jews in the diaspora to review their relationship to Israel. Addressing himself to Israeli leaders, he pleaded Acknowledge that your freedom can be achieved only with 
your Palestinian cousin, not against him. Five years later, Begin insisting that Arabs were the new Nazis and Yasser Arafat was the new Hitler, assaulted Lebanon. By the time Ronald Reagan accused Begin of perpetrating a Holocaust and, ordering, and ordered him to end it, the Israeli Defense Force had killed tens of thousands of Palestinians and Lebanese and obliterated large parts of Beirut. In his novel, Kapo, uh, the Serbian Jewish author, Alexander Tishma, captures the revulsion many of the survivors felt over the images coming out of Lebanon. He wrote, Jews, his kinsmen, the sons and grandsons of his contemporaries, former inmates of the camps, stood in tank turrets and drove flags waving through undefended settlements, through human flesh, ripping it apart from machine gun bullets, rounding up the survivors in camps fenced off with barbed wire. Primo Levi, who had known uh, the horrors of Auschwitz at the same time as Jean Améry, and also felt an emotional affinity to Israel, confessed that Israeli atrocities in Lebanon forced him to agree with those comparing Begin with Nazis. In several works of fiction and non-fiction, Levy had meditated not only on his time in a, in a death camp and its anguished and insoluble legacy, but also on the ever-present threats to human decency and dignity. He quickly organized an open letter of protest and gave an interview in which he said, I quote, Israel is rapidly falling into total isolation. We must choke off the impulses towards emotional solidarity with Israel to reason coldly on the mistakes of its ruling class. Get rid of that ruling class. Primo Levi was especially incensed by Begin's exploitation of the Shoah. Two years later, he was arguing that the Jewish world must turn back, must move out of Israel and back into the diaspora. Misgivings of the kind expressed by Jean Amery and Primo Levi are condemned as grossly anti-Semitic today. It's worth remembering that many such re-examinations of Zionism and anxieties about the perception of Jews in the world were incited among survivors and witnesses of the Shoah by Israel's occupation of Palestinian territory and its manipulative new mythology. Yesha Hau Leibowitz, a highly respected theologian who won the Israel Prize, was already warning in 1969 against the Nazification of Israel, as he called it. In 1980, the Israeli columnist Boaz Efron carefully described the stages of this likely moral corrosion. The tactic of conflating Palestinians with Nazis and shouting that another Shoah is imminent was liberating, he wrote, ordinary Israelis from any moral restrictions since one who's in danger of annihilation sees himself exempted from any moral considerations which might restrict his efforts to save himself. Jews, Hefron wrote, could end up treating non-Jews as subhuman and replicating racist Nazi attitudes. Efron urged caution too against Israel's then new and ardent supporters in the Jewish American population. For them, he argued, championing Israel had become necessary, he wrote, because of the loss of any other focal point to their Jewish identity. Indeed, so great was their perceived existential lack that they did not wish Israel to become free of its mounting dependence on Jewish American support. Zygmunt Bauman, the Polish-born Jewish philosopher and refugee from Nazism who spent three years in Israel in the 1970s, 
before fleeing its new mood of uh, bellicose righteousness, despaired of what he saw as the privatization of the Shoah by Israel and the supporters. It has come to be remembered, he wrote, as a private experience of the Jews, as a matter between the Jews and the haters, even as the conditions that made the Shoah possible appeared around the world. Such survivors of the Shoah who had been plunged from their serene assumptions of European humanism into collective insanity intuited that the violence they had survived, unprecedented in its magnitude, was no aberration of an essentially sound modern civilization. Nor could it be blamed entirely on an ancient prejudice against Jews. Technology and the rational division of labor had enabled ordinary, even unprejudiced people to contribute to acts of mass extermination with a clean conscience, even with free source of virtue. And so preventive efforts against such impersonal and ever possible modes of killing required more than just vigilance against anti-Semitism or other specific circumstances of the Nazi genocide. When I recently turned to my books to prepare this lecture, I found many of the passages quoted above underlined. In my diary, there are copied lines from George Steiner saying, the nation state bristling with arms is a bitter relic, an absurdity in the century of crowded men. There's a line from Abba Eban, the Israeli foreign minister, saying, it's about time that we stand on our own feet and not on those of the six million dead. Most of these annotations uh, date back to my first visit to Israel and its occupied territories. I was seeking then uh, to answer in my innocence two perplexing questions. How did Israel come to exercise such a terrible power of life and death over a population of refugees? And how can the Western political and journalistic mainstream ignore, even justify, its clearly systematic cruelties and injustices? I had grown up imbibing some of the reverential Zionism of my family of upper caste Hindu nationalists in India. Both Zionism and Hindu nationalism emerged in the late 19th century out of an experience of humiliation. Many of their ideologues longed to overcome what they saw as a shameful lack of manhood among Jews and Hindus. And for Hindu nationalists in the, in the 1970s, who were then impotent detractors of the ruling pro-Palestinian Congress party, uncompromising Zionists such as Begin, uh, Sharon, Shamir, seem to have won the race to national muscular manhood. This envy, by the way, is now out of the closet. Uh, Hindu trolls constitute uh, Netanyahu's largest fan club in the world today. I remember I had a picture of Moshe Dayan on my wall, and even long after my childish infatuation with crude strength faded, I did not cease to see Israel the way its leaders began to present the country from the 1960s onwards as national redemption for the victims of the Shoah, an unbreakable guarantee against its recurrence. I knew how little the plight of Jews scapegoated during Germany's social and economic breakdown had registered in the conscience of Western European and American leaders, how even Shoah survivors were met with a cold shoulder, and in Eastern Europe with fresh pogroms. Though convinced of the justice of the Palestinian cause, I found it hard to resist the Zionist logic that Jews cannot survive in non-Jewish lands and that they must have a state of their own. I even thought it was unjust that Israel alone among all countries in the world needed to justify its very right to exist. 
I was not naive enough to think that suffering ennobles or empowers the victims of a great atrocity to act in a morally superior way. The, that yesterday's victims are very prone to become today's victimizers is the lesson of organized violence in the former Yugoslavia, Sudan, Congo, Rwanda, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, just too many, too many places. I was still shocked by the dark meaning that the Israeli state had drawn from the Shoah and then institutionalized in a machinery of repression. The targeted killings of Palestinians, checkpoints, home demolitions, land thefts, arbitrary and indefinite detentions, widespread torture in prisons, all of this seemed to proclaim a pitiless national ethos that humankind is divided into those who are strong and those who are weak. And so those who have been, so those who have been or expect to be victims should preemptively crush their perceived enemies. Though I had read Edward Said, I was still shocked to discover for myself, I'm still shocked how insidiously Israel's high place supporters in the West conceal the nihilistic survival of the strongest ideology reproduced by all Israeli regimes since Begin. They ought to be concerned for the sake of their own interests with the crimes of the occupiers, if not the suffering of the dispossessed and the dehumanized. But both have passed without much scrutiny in the respectable press of the Western world. Anyone calling attention to the spectacle of Washington's blind commitment to Israel is accused of anti-Semitism and of ignoring the lessons of the Shoah. And a distorted consciousness of the Shoah ensures that whenever the victims of Israel, unable to endure their misery, revolt with predictable ferocity, they are denounced as Nazis hell-bent on perpetrating another Shoah. In reading and annotating the, the writings of uh, Jean, Amory, uh, Primo Levi and others, I was, I was trying to somehow mitigate the oppressive sense of wrongness I felt after being first exposed to Israel's bleak interpretation of the Shoah and the certificates of righteousness lavished on the country by its Western allies. I was looking, I suppose, for some kind of reassurance from, from people who had known in their own frail bodies, the monstrous terror visited by Europe's most civilized nation state on millions. People who had resolved to be on perpetual guard against the deformation of the Shoah's meaning and the abuse of its memory. Contrary to their expanding reservations about Israel, a political class and a political and media class in the West has ceaselessly euphemized the stark facts of military occupation and unchecked annexation by ethno-national demagogues. Israel, the loud chorus always goes, has the right as the Middle East's only democracy to defend itself, especially from genocidal brutes. As a result, the victims of Israeli barbarity in Gaza today cannot even secure clear recognition of their ordeal, let alone relief. In recent months, billions of people around the world have witnessed, for the first time in history, an extraordinary onslaught whose victims, as the Irish lawyer who's representing South Africa uh, at the International Court of Justice in The Hague put it, these victims are broadcasting their own destruction in real time in the desperate, so far vain hope that the world might do something. But the world, more specifically the West, which can do much, doesn't do anything. Worse, the liquidation of Gaza, though outlined and broadcast by its perpetrators themselves, is daily obfuscated, if not denied, by the instruments of the West's military and cultural hegemony. <laughs>
from the US president claiming that Palestinians are liars and European politicians intoning Israel's right to defend itself to the prestigious news outlets deploying the passive tense while relating the everyday massacres in Gaza by Israeli fanatics. We find ourselves in an unprecedented situation. Never before have so many witnessed an industrial scale slaughter in real time. Yet the prevailing callousness, timidity and censorship disallows, even mocks our shock and grief. And so many of us who have seen some of the images and videos coming out of Gaza, those visions from hell of corpses twisted together and then being buried in mass graves, the smaller corpses held by grieving parents or, or laid on the ground in neat rows, we have been quietly going mad over the last few months. We, we carry on, we carry on, of course, we work, we eat, we sleep, we talk, we occasionally even laugh. But every day is poisoned by the awareness that while we go on about our lives, hundreds of ordinary people like ourselves are being murdered or being forced to witness the murder of their children. Those driven by the guilt of helpless implication to scan Joe Biden's elderly face for some sign of mercy, some sign of an end to bloodletting, find an eerily smooth hardness, broken only by a nervous little smirk when he blurts out Israeli lies about beheaded babies. Biden's stubborn malice and cruelty to Palestinians is just one of the many gruesome riddles presented to us by Western politicians and journalists. The Shoah traumatized at least two Jewish generations and the massacres and hostage taking in Israel on 7th October by Hamas and other Palestinian groups rekindled the fear of collective extermination among many Jews. But it was clear from the start that the most fanatical and immoral Israeli leadership in history would not shrink from exploiting a widespread sense of violation, bereavement and horror. It would have been easy for Western leaders to choke off their impulses of unconditional solidarity with an extremist regime while acknowledging the necessity to bring the murderers and rapists of October 7 to justice. Why then did Keir Starmer, formerly a human rights lawyer, assert that the government of avowed ethnic cleansers has the right to starve Palestinians. Why would Germany feverishly start selling arms to Netanyahu and Gallant and provide with its mendacious media and ruthless crackdown, especially on Jewish artists and thinkers, a fresh lesson to the world in how murderous ethno-nationalism commanded such quick ascent in that country? What explains such headlines in the BBC and New York Times as Hind Rajab, six, found dead in Gaza days after phone calls for help? Tears of Gaza father who lost, who lost 103 relatives. And more recently, man dies after setting himself on fire outside Israeli embassy in Washington. Police say, why have Western politicians and journalists kept presenting tens of thousands of dead and maimed Palestinians as collateral damage in a war of self-defense forced upon the world's most moral army? The answers for many people around the world cannot but be tainted by a long simmering racial bitterness. Palestine, George Orwell pointed out in 1945, was is a color issue. This is how it was seen by Gandhi, who pleaded with Zionist leaders not to resort to terrorism against Arabs with Western arms. This is how it was seen by post-colonial nations who almost all refused to recognize the state of Israel. What W.E.B. Du Bois called the central problem of international politics, the color line, also weighed on the mind of Nelson Mandela when he said that South Africa's freedom from apartheid is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. James Baldwin 
sought to actively profane what he termed a pious silence around Israel's behavior. He claimed that the Jewish state which sold arms to apartheid South Africa embodied white supremacy rather than democracy. Muhammad Ali saw Palestine as an instance of gross racial injustice. So do today the leaders of the United States' oldest and most prominent black Christian denominations when they accuse Israel of genocide and ask Biden to end all financial as well as military aid to the country. In 1967, James Baldwin was tactless enough to say that the suffering of Jewish people is recognized, he put it, as part of the moral history of the world, but this is not true for the blacks. In 2024, many more people can see that when compared to the Jewish victims of Nazism, the countless millions consumed by slavery, the numerous Victorian Holocaust, the, nu the victims of the nuclear assaults on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, these are barely remembered. Billions of non-Westerners have been furiously politicized in recent years by the West's calamitous war on terror, vaccine apartheid during the pandemic, and barefaced hypocrisy over the plight of Ukrainians and Palestinians. They can hardly fail to notice a belligerent version of Holocaust denial among the elites of former imperialist countries who refuse to address their countries' past of genocidal brutality and plunder and work hard to delegitimize any discussion of it as deranged wokeness. Popular accounts of totalitarianism continue to ignore the acute descriptions of Nazism by Jawaharlal Nehru and M. A. Césaire, among other imperial subjects, as the radical twin of Western imperialism. They shy away from exploring the obvious connection between the imperial slaughter of natives in the colonies that preceded the genocidal terrors perpetrated against Jews inside Europe. Certainly one of the great dangers um, emanating from Gaza today is the hardening of the color line into a new Maginot line across hearts and minds. For most of the people outside the West, whose primordial experience of European civilization was to be brutally colonized by its representatives, the Shoah did not appear as an unprecedented atrocity. Recovering from the ravages of imperialism in their own countries, most non-Western people were in no position to appreciate the magnitude of the horror, the radical twin of that imperialism inflicted on Jews in Europe. So when Israel's leaders compare Hamas to Nazis and Israeli diplomats wear yellow stars at the UN, their audience is almost exclusively Western. Most of the world is untroubled by the burden of Christian European guilt over the Shoah and does not regard the creation of Israel as a moral necessity to absolve the sins of 20th century Europeans. For more than seven decades now, the argument among the so-called darker peoples has remained unanswerably the same. Why should Palestinians be dispossessed and punished for the crimes in which only Europeans were complicit? They can only recoil with disgust from the implicit claim that Israel has the right to slaughter 13,000 children because it's a Jewish state born out of the Shoah. In 2006, Tony Jack was already warning that, as he wrote, the Holocaust can no longer be instrumentalized to excuse Israel's behavior since a growing number of people simply cannot understand how the horrors of the last European war can be invoked to license or condone unacceptable behavior in another time and place. Israel's long cultivated persecution mania, he wrote, everyone is out to get us, no longer elicits sympathy, he warned. And prophecies of universal anti-Semitism risk becoming a self-fulfilling assertion. 
Israel's reckless behavior, he wrote, and its insistent identification of all criticism with anti-Semitism is now the leading source of anti-Jewish sentiment in Western Europe and, and much of Asia. Israel's most devout friends today are inflaming this situation. As the Israeli filmmaker Yuval Abram put it just yesterday, he was, uh, some of you might know, was um, cancelled at the Berlin Film Festival. Um, he wrote, the appalling misuse of the accusation of anti-Semitism by Germans empties it of meaning and thus endangers Jews all over the world. Biden keeps making the very dangerous argument that the safety of the Jewish population worldwide depends on Israel. But as the New York Times columnist Ezra Klein put it recently, he said, I'm a Jewish person, do I feel safer? Do I feel like there is less anti-Semitism in the world right now because of what is happening there? Or does it seem to me there's a huge upsurge of anti-Semitism and that even Jews in places that are not Israel are vulnerable to what happens in Israel. This ruinous scenario was very clearly anticipated by the Shoah survivors quoted at the start of this talk. People who first warned of the damage inflicted on the memory of the Shoah by its instrumentalization. Bauman warned repeatedly after the 1980s that such tactics by unscrupulous politicians were securing what he called a post-mortem triumph for Hitler, who dreamed of creating conflict between Jews and the whole world and preventing Jews from ever having a peaceful coexistence with others. Jean Améry, made desperate in his last years by burgeoning anti-Semitism, pleaded Israelis to treat even Palestinian terrorists humanely so that the solidarity between many diaspora Zionists like himself and Israel does not become, he wrote, the basis for a communion of two doomed parties in the face of catastrophe. There is not much to be hoped in this regard from Israel's present leaders. The discovery of extreme vulnerability to Hezbollah as well as Hamas ought to make them more willing to risk a compromise peace settlement. Yet they crazily seek with all the 2,000 pound bombs lavished on them by Biden to regain deterrence and to further militarize their occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. Such self-harm is the long-term effect Boaz Efron was warning against in 1980 of what he called what he said, the continuous mentioning of the Holocaust, anti-Semitism, and the hatred of Jews in all generations. Since he wrote, a leadership cannot be separated from its own propaganda, Israel's ruling class acts like chieftains of a sect operating in the world of myths and monsters created by its own hands, and is no longer able to understand what is happening in the real world, or the historical processes in which the state is caught. Forty years after Ephron wrote this, it's clearer too that Israel's Western patrons have turned out to be the country's worst enemies, ushering their wards deeper into hallucination. As Ephron said, Western powers act against their own interests and to apply to Israel a special preferential relationship without Israel seeing itself obligated to reciprocate. Consequently, the special treatment given to Israel has created an economic and political hothouse around Israel, cutting it off from global realities. The most treacherous of these realities at present is the enlarged viciousness to which Jewish people everywhere are exposed to by the Israeli claim to be acting on their behalf. In the longer term, however, Netanyahu and his cohort threatened the very basis of the global order that was rebuilt after the revelation of Nazi crimes. Even before Gaza, the Shoah was losing its central place in our imagination of the past and future. 
It's true that no historical atrocity has been so widely, diversely and obsessively commemorated. But the culture of remembrance around the Shoah has now accumulated its own long history. That history shows that the memory of the Shoah did not merely spring organically from what transpired between 1939 and 1945. It was constructed, often very deliberately, and with specific political ends. The ideological pressures brought to bear on the memory of the Shoah are increasingly visible, and they endanger the universal salience of the Shoah. Germany's, the fact that Germany's Nazi regime and its European collaborators had murdered six million Jews was widely known after 1945. But for many years, the stupefying fact had little political and intellectual resonance. In the 1940s and 50s, the Shoah was not seen as an atrocity separate from other atrocities of the war the attempted extermination of, of the Slav populations, gypsies, disabled peoples, and homosexuals. Of course, um, most European peoples had self-interested reasons not to dwell on the killing of Jews. Germans obsessed self-pityingly with their own trauma of bombing and occupation by Allied powers and mass expulsion from Eastern Europe. France, Poland, Austria, and the Netherlands which had eagerly cooperated with the Nazis, wanted to present themselves as part of a valiant resistance against Nazism. Furthermore, too many indecent reminders of complicity existed long after 1945. Germany had former Nazis as its chancellor and president. French President Francois Mitterrand had been an apparatchik in the Vichy regime. As late as 1992, the president of Austria was Kurt Waldheim, despite evidence of his involvement in Nazi atrocities. Even in the United States, there was, uh, as Edith Zertel writes in a book, Israel's Holocaust and the Politics of Nationhood, there was public silence and some sort of status denial regarding the Holocaust. It began to be publicly remembered years after 1945, in Israel itself, awareness of the Shoah was limited for years to its survivors, who, it's astonishing to remember today, were drenched with contempt by leaders of the Zionist movement. The country's founder, First Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion, had seen Hitler's rise to power as a huge political and economic boost for the Zionist enterprise. But he did not consider what he called human debris from Hitler's death camps as fit material for the construction of a strong Zionist state. Everything they had endured, Ben Gurion said, purged their souls of all good. Attitudes began to change only with the trial of Adolf Eichmann in 1961. In the seventh million, the Israeli historian Tom Segev recounts how Ben-Gurion, who was accused by Begin and other political rivals of being insensitive about the Shoah, decided to stage a national catharsis with the trial of a Nazi war criminal. He hoped to educate Jews from Arab countries about the Shoah and European anti-Semitism, neither of which they were familiar with, and start binding them with Jews of European ancestry in what seemed too clearly an imperfectly imagined community. Segev goes on to describe how Begin advanced this process of forging a Shoah consciousness among darker-skinned Jews who had long suffered racist humiliation from the country's white establishment. Begin healed their injuries of class and race by promising them stolen Palestinian land and a socio-economic status above dispossessed and destitute Arabs.
This broad distribution of the wages of Israeliness among the wretched coincided with the eruption of identity politics among an affluent minority in the United States. As Peter Novick clarifies with uh, startling detail in the Holocaust in American life, the Shoah didn't loom that large in the life of America's Jews until the late 1960s. Only a few books and films touched on the subject. A film like Judgment at Nuremberg folded the mass murder of Jews into a larger category of the crimes of Nazism. In his essay titled The Intellectual and Jewish Fate, published in the Jewish magazine Commentary in 1957, Norman Podhoretz, the patron saint of neoconservative Zionists in the 1980s, said nothing at all about the Shoah. Jewish organizations, notorious later for their policing of opinion about Zionism, discouraged memorialization of Europe's Jewish victims. They were then scrambling to learn the new rules of the geopolitical game. In the quick chameleonic shifts of the early Cold War, the Soviet Union moved from being a stalwart ally against Nazi Germany into a totalitarian evil. And Germany moved from being a totalitarian evil into a stalwart democratic ally against totalitarian evil. Accordingly, the editor of Commentary urged American Jews to nurture what it said would be a realistic attitude rather than a punitive and recriminatory one towards Germany, which was now a pillar, it said, of Western democratic civilization. This extensive gaslighting by the free world's political and thought leaders shocked and embittered many survivors of the Shoah. However, they weren't regarded then as, unique, as uniquely privileged witnesses of the modern world. Jean Amery, who absolutely hated what he said was the obtrusive philo-Semitism of post-war Germany, Amory was reduced to amplifying his private resentments in essays aimed at ruffling what he said was the miserable conscience of German readers. In one of these essays, he describes traveling through Germany in the 1960s, how while he's discussing Saul Bellow's latest novel with the country's um, refined intellectuals, he called them, he cannot forget the stony faces of ordinary Germans before a pile of corpses. He discovered during, this, during these travels that he bore a new grudge against Germans and their new exalted place in the majestic halls of the West. Jean Amery's um, experience of absolute loneliness before his Gestapo torturers had destroyed his trust in the world, he wrote. It was only after his liberation that he had again known mutual understanding with the rest of humanity. Because, he wrote, those who had tortured me and turned me into a bug seemed to provoke universal abhorrence and contempt. But Amory's healing faith in the equilibrium of world morality as he called it, had been quickly shattered by the subsequent Western embrace of Germany and the free world's eager recruitment of former Nazis in its new power game against the Soviet Union. Amory would have felt even more betrayed had he seen the staff memorandum of the American Jewish Committee, which regretted the fact that for most Jews, reasoning about Germany and the Germans is still beclouded by strong emotion. Peter Novick explains that American Jews, like other ethnic groups, were anxious to avoid the charge of dual loyalty and to take advantage of post-war America's dramatically expanding material opportunities. They became more alert to Israel's presence during the extensively publicized and controversy-haunted trial of uh, Adolf Eichmann, which also made inescapable the fact that Jews had been Hitler's primary targets and victims. But it was only after the Six-Day War in 1967 
and the Yom Kippur War in 1973, when Israel seemed existentially threatened by its Arab enemies, that the Shoah came to be broadly conceived in both Israel and the United States as the emblem of Jewish vulnerability in an eternally hostile world. Jewish organizations started to deploy the motto, never again, to lobby for American policies favorable to Israel. The United States, which was facing humiliating defeat in East Asia, began to see an apparently invincible Israel as a valuable proxy in the Middle East and inaugurated its lavish subvention of the Jewish state. In turn, the narrative promoted by Israeli leaders and American Zionist groups of the Shoah as present and imminent danger to Jews began to serve as a basis for collective self-definition for many Jewish Americans in the 1970s. Jewish Americans were by then the most educated and prosperous minority groups in America and increasingly irreligious. Yet, in the rancorously polarized American society of the late 60s and 70s, where ethnic and racial sequestration became common amid a widespread sense of disorder and insecurity, and historical calamity turned into a proud badge of identity and moral rectitude, more and more assimilated Jewish Americans affiliated themselves with the memory of the Shoah and forged a personal connection with Israel that they saw threatened by genocidal anti-Semites. A Jewish political tradition preoccupied with inequality, poverty, civil rights, environmentalism, nuclear disarmament, anti-imperialism, mutated into an organized hyper-attentiveness attentiveness to the Middle East's only democracy. In his private journals from the 1960s onwards, the literary critic Alfred Kazan charts um, alternating between bafflement and scorn, the psychodramas of personal identity that rapidly created, together with organized Zionist groups, Israel's most loyal constituency abroad. He wrote, the present period of Jewish success will someday be remembered as one of the greatest irony. The Jews caught in a trap, the Jews murdered, and bango, out of ashes, all this inescapable lament and exploitation of the Holocaust. Israel as the Jews' safeguard, the Holocaust as a new Bible, more than a book of lamentations. Kazan was allergic to the American cult of Elie Wiesel, who went around asserting that the Shoah was incomprehensible, incomparable, unrepresentable, and also that Palestinians had no right to Jerusalem. In Kazan's view, the American Jewish middle class had found in Elie Wiesel, Jesus of the Holocaust, as he called him, a surrogate for their own religious vacancy. This potent identity politics of the American elite, of an American elite, was not lost on Primo Levi on his only visit to the country in 1985, two years before he killed himself. He had been profoundly disturbed by the culture of conspicuous Holocaust consumption around Elie Wiesel. Uh, he was also disturbed by Elie Wiesel, who claimed to have been Levy's great friend in Auschwitz. And Levy did not recall ever meeting him. In America, he was very puzzled by his American hostess' uh, voyeuristic obsession with his Jewishness. Writing to friends back in Turin, he complained that Americans had, as he wrote, pinned a star of David on him. At a talk in Brooklyn, Primo Levi, when asked for his opinion on Middle East politics, started to say that Israel was a mistake in historical terms. There was an uproar, and the moderator had to halt the meeting. Later that year, commentary raucously pro-Israel by now, commissioned a 24-year-old wannabe Zionist to launch 
venomous attacks on Primo Levi. By Levi's own admission, this intellectual thuggery, which, uh, by the way, is bitterly regretted by its now anti-Zionist author, this thuggery helped extinguish his will to live. Recent American literature most clearly manifests this paradox that the more remote the Shoah grew in time, the more fiercely its memory came to be possessed by later generations of Jewish Americans. I'd been really shocked by the irreverence with which Isaac Beshevis Singer, born in 1904 in Poland, in many ways the quintessentially Jewish writer of the 20th century, depicted Shoah survivors in his fiction and derided both the state of Israel and the eager philo-Semitism of American Gentiles. A novel like Shadows on the Hudson almost seems designed to prove that persecution and oppression do not improve moral character. But much younger and more secularized Jewish writers than Singer seemed all too submerged in what Gillian Rose in her scathing essay on Schindler's List called Holocaust Piety. In a review of A History of Love, a novel by Nicole Krauss set in Israel, United States and Europe, James Wood pointed out that its author, born in 1974, proceeds, he wrote, as if the Holocaust happened just yesterday. A strenuously willed affiliation with the Shoah has also marked and diminished much of American journalism about Israel. More consequentially, the secular political religion of the Shoah and over-identification with Israel since the 1970s has fatally distorted the foreign policy of Israel's main sponsor, the United States. In 1982, shortly before uh, Reagan bluntly ordered Begin to seize his Holocaust in Lebanon, a young US senator who revered uh, Elie Wiesel as his great teacher met the Israeli prime minister. In um, Begin's, uh, Begin's own stunt account of the meeting, the senator commended the Israeli war effort in Lebanon and boasted that he would have gone further, even if it meant killing women and children. Begin himself was taken aback by the bloodthirstiness of the future US President Joe Biden. He had to insist, no sir, according to our values, it's forbidden to hurt women and children even in war. This is a yardstick of human civilization not to hurt civilians. A long period of relative peace has made most of us oblivious to the calamities that preceded it. Only a handful of people alive today can recall the experience of total war that defined the first half of the 20th century, the imperial and national struggles inside and outside Europe, the ideological mass mobilizations the eruptions of fascism and militarism. Nearly half a century of the most brutal conflicts and the biggest moral breakdowns in history had exposed the dangers of a world where no religious or ethical constraint existed over what human beings could do or dare do. Secular reason and modern science, which displaced and replaced traditional religion, had not only revealed their incapacity to legislate human conduct, they were implicated in the new efficient modes of slaughter demonstrated by Auschwitz and Hiroshima. In the decades of reconstruction after 1945, it became slowly possible to believe again in the concept of modern, his modern society in its institutions as an unambiguously civilizing force, in its laws as defense against vicious passions. This tentative belief was enshrined and affirmed by a negative secular theology derived from the exposure of Nazi crimes never again. This was the post-war world's own categorical 
imperative. And it was gradually, it gradually acquired institutional form um, with the establishment of organizations like Amnesty International, uh, vigilant human rights outfits like uh, Human Rights Watch, our organizations like the International Criminal Court. Um, a major document of the post-war years, the preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, is suffused with the fear of repeating Europe's past of racial apocalypse. In recent decades, as utopian imaginings of a better socio-economic order faded, the ideal of human rights, the last utopia, as Samuel Moyne calls it, drew even more authority from memories of the great evil committed during the Shoah. Whether Spanish people fighting for reparative justice after long years of a brutal dictatorship, the Latin Americans ag agitating on behalf of their desaparecidos, the Bosnians appealing for protection from Serbian ethnic cleansers, uh, the, the Korean plea for, re of, of, for redress for the comfort women and slaves by the Japanese during the Second World War, or the subtitle of The Rape of Nanking, Iris Chang's best-selling book, The Forgotten Holocaust of World War II, memories of Jewish suffering at the hands of Nazis are the foundation upon which most descriptions of extreme ideology and atrocity and demands for recognition and reparations have been built. These memories have helped define the notions of responsibility, collective guilt, and crimes against humanity. It is true that they have been continually abused by the exponents of military human humanitarianism who reduce human rights to the right not to be brutally murdered. And of course, cynicism breeds faster when formulaic modes of Shoah commemoration, solemn face trips to Auschwitz followed by effusive camaraderie with Netanyahu in Jerusalem, become the cheap price of the ticket to respectability for anti-Semitic politicians, Islamophobic agitators, and Elon Musk. <laughs> or when Netanyahu grants moral absolution in exchange for support to frankly anti-Semitic politicians in Eastern Europe that continually seek to rehabilitate the fervent local executioners of Jews during the Shoah. Yet in the absence of anything more effective, the Shoah remains indispensable as a standard for gauging the political and moral health of societies. Its memory, though prone to abuse, can still be used to uncover the more insidious inequities today. When I look at my own writings about the anti-Muslim, admirers of Hitler in India today and their malign influence, I'm struck by how often I have cited the Jewish experience of prejudice to warn against the barbarism that becomes possible when certain taboos are broken. All these universalist reference points, the Shoah as the measure of all crimes, anti-Semitism as the most lethal form of bigotry, are in danger of disappearing as the Israeli military massacres and starves Palestinians, raises their homes, schools, hospitals, mosques, churches, bombs them into smaller and smaller encampments, while denouncing as anti-Semitic or champions of Hamas, all those who plead with it to desist, from the United Nations to the Spanish, Irish, Brazilian, and South African governments, and the Vatican. Israel today is dynamiting the edifice of global norms built out in 1945 and tottering since the catastrophic and still unpunished war on terror and Vladimir Putin's revanchism. The profound rupture we feel today between the past and the present is a rupture in the moral history of the world since the ground zero of 1945. The history in which the Shoah has been for many years the central event and universal reference. There are more earthquakes ahead. According to a recent poll, an absolute majority, 88% of the Jewish public in Israel, justifies Palestinian casualties. 
Israeli politicians have resolved to prevent a Palestinian state, and the Israeli government has been blocking humanitarian aid to Gaza. Biden now admits that his Israeli dependents are guilty of indiscriminate bombing, but he compulsively hands out more and more military hardware to them. Last week, the United States scorned for the third time at the Security Council the world's desperate wish for an end to the bloodbath in Gaza. This week, Biden floated while licking an ice cream, his own fantasy, quickly shot down by both Israel and Hamas, of a temporary ceasefire. In the United Kingdom, Labour as well as Tory politicians search for verbal formulas that can appease enraged public opinion while providing moral cover to the carnage in Gaza. It hardly seems believable, but the evidence has become overwhelming. We are witnessing some kind of world historical collapse in the free world. At the same time, Gaza has become for countless powerless people the essential condition of political and ethical consciousness in the 21st century, just as the First World War was for a Western generation. And increasingly, it seems that only those thrown into intellectual, political, and ethical existence by the calamity of Gaza can rescue the Shoah from Netanyahu, Biden, Scholz, and Sunak and re-universalize its moral significance. Only they can be trusted to restore what Jean Amery called the equilibrium of world morality. Many of the protesters who fill the streets of their cities week after week have no immediate relation to the American past or the Shoah. They judge Israel by its actions on, in Gaza rather than its Shoah and sanctified demand for total and permanent security. Whether or not they know about the Shoah, they reject the crude social Darwinist lesson Israel draws from it, the survival of one group of people at the expense of another. They are motivated by the simple wish to uphold the ideals that seem so universally desirable after 1945. Tolerance for the otherness of beliefs and ways of life solidarity with human suffering, and a heightened sense of moral responsibility for the weak and persecuted. These men and women know that if there is any bumper sticker lesson to be drawn from the Shoah, it is never again for anyone, the slogan of the brave young activists of Jewish Voice for Peace. It's possible they will lose. Perhaps Israel with its survivalist psychosis is not the bitter relic George Steiner called it. Rather, it is the portent of a bankrupt and exhausted world's future. It's full-throated endorsement by far-right figures like Bolsonaro, Millet. It's avid patronage by countries where white nationalists have infected political life with racial hatreds. And think about these countries, the US, UK, France, Germany, Italy, all of this suggests that the world of individual rights, open frontiers, and international law is receding behind us. It's possible that Israel will succeed in ethnically cleansing Gaza, even the West Bank. There is too much evidence that the moral arc of the universe does not bend to justice. Powerful men can make their massacres seem necessary and righteous, and ultimately get away with them. It's not at all difficult to imagine a triumphant conclusion to Israel's onslaught on Gaza. This fear of catastrophic defeat obviously weighs on the minds of the protesters who disrupt Biden's campaign speeches and are then expelled from his presence to a chorus of four more years. Disbelief over what they see every day in videos from Gaza and the fear of more unbridled brutality clearly hounds those online dissenters who daily excoriate the pillars of the Western Fourth Estate for their intimacy with brute power. Accusing Israel of committing genocide, they seem to very deliberately violate the moderate and sensible opinion 
that places the country as well as the Shoah outside the history of racial expansionism. And they probably persuade no one in a, a hardened Western political mainstream. But then Jean Amery himself, when he addressed his resentments to the miserable conscience of refined intellectuals, was, he wrote, not at all speaking with the intention to convince. I just blindly throw my word onto the scale, whatever it may weigh. Feeling deceived and abandoned by the free world, he aired his resentments. In order, he wrote, that the crime become a moral reality for the criminal, in order that he be swept into the truth of his atrocity. Israel's clamorous accusers today seem to aim at little more. They probably can't aim at more. Against the acts of savagery and the propaganda by omission and obfuscation, countless millions now proclaim in public spaces and on digital media their furious resentments. In the process, they risk permanently embittering their lives. But perhaps their outrage alone will alleviate, for now, the Palestinian feeling of absolute loneliness and go some way towards redeeming the memory of the Shoah. Thank you.